reading from 2 Kings 15 this morning. And before we read, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that you are our only hope. That you have loved us first and then given us grace to love you. And as we come to your word today to see that grace is absolutely what we need in the beginning to carry us through and all the way to when we hear those glorious words, well done, good and faithful servant, we pray that you would lift our hearts to praise you and to give you all glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Kings chapter 15. You may notice a bit of a scratch in my voice. I have a little bit of a cold. So bear with me as we go through. But 2 Kings 15. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died, and he lived in a separate house. Jotham, the king's son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. As for the other events of Azariah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Azariah rested with his fathers and was buried near them in the city of David. And Jotham, his king, Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, became king in Israel in Samaria, and he reigned six months. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Shalem, son of Jabez, conspired against Zechariah. He attacked him in front of the people, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. The other events of Zechariah's reign are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. So the word of the Lord, spoken to Jehu, was fulfilled. Your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Shalem, son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. And he reigned in Samaria one month. Then Menahem, son of Gadai, went from Tirzah up to Samaria. He attacked Shalem, son of Jabesh, in Samaria, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. The other events of Shalem's reign and the conspiracy he led are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem, starting out from Tirzah, attacked Tipsa and everyone in the city and its vicinity because they refused to open their gates. He he sacked Tipsa and ripped open all the pregnant women. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, son of Gadai, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria ten years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord during his entire reign. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Then Pul, son of a king of Assyria, invaded the land, and Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold on the kingdom. Menahem exacted this money from Israel. Every wealthy man had to contribute 50 shekels of silver to be given to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria withdrew and stayed in the land no longer. As for the other events of Menahem's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Menahem rested with his fathers, and Pekahiah his son succeeded him as king. In the fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, son of Menahem, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned two years. Pekahiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. One of his chief officers, Pekah, son of Ramaliah, conspired against him. Taking fifty men of Gilead with him, he assassinated Pekahiah along with Argob and Arya, in the citadel of the royal palace at Samaria. So Pekah killed Pekahiah and succeeded him as king. The other events of Pekahiah's reign and all he did are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. In the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, son of Ramaliah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. 
He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. In the time of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, king of Syria, came and took Aijan, Abel Beth Maacah, Genoa, Kadesh, and Hazor. He took Gilead and Galilee, including all the land of Naphtali, and deported the people to Assyria. Then Hosea, son of Elah, conspired against Pekah, son of Ramalia. He attacked and assassinated him, and then succeeded him as king in the twentieth year of Jotham, son of Uzziah. As for the other events of Pekah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? In the second year of Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. As for the other events of Jotham's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, against Judah. Jotham rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David, the city of his father. And Ahaz succeeded him as king. You know, in some recent weeks here, there's been a, a series of what you might call deconversions, very public deconversions among uh, some Christians. One of those deconversions was by a man named Joshua Harris. Joshua Harris kind of rocketed to evangelical fame as a young man, an author, became pastor of a very large church at a, a pretty young age. And just here recently, he announced that he's divorced his wife and he's left the faith behind entirely. The, once, the faith that he had once preached, now he has abandoned the Christ which he had once preached, now he is abandoned. Then there's another one who was very public, a man named Marty Sampson. He's a, a writer and singer for music group, Christian music group Hillsong. He came out and he, he had this to say, just a part of what he had to say. He said, time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. So what do, what do we do? What do Christians do when when very big name, when very public figures in the, in the Christian world, what do we do with that? What do we do when people abandon the faith they once had, when they abandon the Christ which they once lived? Well, as strange, it loved, as strange as it may seem, I think much of the answer is bound up for us here in 2 Kings 15. Because we see here two very different kingdoms. And these two kingdoms and what becomes of them will help us to understand how to understand those who before us have left the faith, those who during our day have left the faith. And the Lord tells us in the Word there will be those who claim belief but do not actually have belief who will leave up until the very end. So the passage before us in 2 Kings 15 helps us to understand this. And as we come to these to these verses, to this chapter, we see two very different kingdoms going in two very different directions. And the first of these kingdoms is Israel. And Israel has entered into a, a death spiral. And you see in this passage, it's literally a death spiral because king after king after king after king not only dies, but is murdered. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 15, all that's left of Israel is just a, a little small part around its capital soon to be extinguished. But meanwhile, in the south, in Judah, we see that we've come to a, a place of relative stability. And there are kings who reign for a very long time. And we begin there with verses 1 to 7 with King Azariah. You know, sometimes it's confusing in the scriptures because the same person can have two names. And Azariah is one of those persons. He's called Azariah here. But then other places in the same chapter, he's called Uzziah, and he's called Uzziah in Isaiah, and he's called Uzziah in Second Chronicles. So to, to minimize confusion, I'll call him Uzziah throughout, even though the, the text includes both names for him. Well, Uzziah becomes king, and he reigns for 52 years. 52 years is a very long time to have one king over one nation. And this is especially a, a rest. This is a much-needed rest, a much-needed time of stability because 
Judah has had four rulers in a row who have died of unnatural causes, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, and then Amaziah, Uzziah's father. But now you have a king who reigns for 52 years, and finally you have a king who dies of natural causes. But we see, even though this king reigns for a long time, he's still not a perfect king by any measure. We read again that the high places are not removed. People continue to burn incense there. Then we have this very strange little bit that's unexplained in the book of Kings that says the Lord struck Uzziah with leprosy. Why would the Lord strike Uzziah with leprosy? He's a, he does what is right in the eyes of the Lord. He reigns for a good long time. Why would the Lord strike him with leprosy? Well, the author of Kings doesn't elaborate most likely because he expects that his original audience already knows the answer. And so, if you hop over to Second Chronicles 26, you begin to get an idea of what has happened. Uzziah is a, a wildly successful king. The Lord gives him success everywhere he goes. He defeats the Philistines and the Arabs and the Amorites. He extends the border of Judah all the way to Egypt. He builds watchtowers and fortresses. He digs wells. He has so many livestock, so many animals, that he has to dig wells in the wilderness to be able to get enough water for all of them. And he even installs artillery on the walls of Jerusalem to protect it against future attack. He's incredibly successful. But then the, the text in Second Chronicles 26 says this in verse 16. After Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What's wrong with that? Well, the Lord didn't tell kings to offer sacrifices in the temple. The Lord told priests to offer sacrifices in the temple. It was wrong for Uzziah to do that. But Uzziah, in his pride, thought that he was so great that he could disregard the instructions of the Lord, that he was above the law. But as King Jesus shows us, no one is too great to be above God's law. So let the modern reader understand that you are never too great, that you are above God's law either. But anyways, Uzziah reigns for 52 years, and his reign overlaps with six different kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. The first is Jeroboam, whom we looked at last week, and then we see the next five included in this chapter. Now, five kings in one chapter is pretty fast. You're, you're, you're whipping through these guys pretty quickly, one after another. It's almost like the author is saying, let's get past these losers and get on to the rest of the story. We don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these guys. They're not noteworthy, and they're all scumbags. And so he goes through them one after another after another. And remember that things are going quite well in Judah, and things are anything but in the north. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, why? Why does the south have stability while the north has anything but? That's a question that we should be thankful the text gives us an answer to. It's an implied answer anyways. But we'll go through these five kings. The first of the five kings is King Zechariah. His father, his father Jeroboam II, was incredibly successful as a king. He reigned for a long time as well. But Zechariah doesn't reign for as long as his father. He doesn't reign for 52 years. He doesn't even reign for 52 months. He becomes king. He reigns for six months. He continues to worship idols like his father. And then he dies. But he doesn't just die. He's murdered. And he's not just murdered, but he's murdered publicly in front of the people. This is a humiliating way to die. These are supposed to be your subjects, but they're not your subjects. They watch you bleed out in the streets. And then... His murderer becomes king. Shalom is the assassin, and he's the next king. Shalom doesn't reign for 52 years, not for 52 months, not even 52 days. He reigns for one month. He becomes king. He commits, adult, he commits idolatry. Then he is murdered as well. Then his murderer becomes king. Then we have the next king, King Menahem, the assassin. He becomes king. He does very much the same thing as those who came before him. He murders his way to the throne, he becomes king, he commits idolatry, but he has a bit longer reign, at least relatively longer compared to the other kings of Israel in this time. He reigns for 10 years. But he's a nasty brute of a king. 
he commits what we might call in, in modern language war crimes or atrocities. He goes up and he attacks the city and the, the city won't surrender to him. So when he finally gets into the city and attacks it, he destroys everyone in there and even rips open pregnant women. He commits uh, atrocities that might even make the, the murderers at Planned Parenthood begin to blush at how disgusting they are. And then he dies of natural causes and his son, Pekahiah, becomes king. And now... You might expect that maybe, just maybe, there might be some stability here because you had a king and he dies of natural causes and then his son becomes king. Maybe things are going to get back to the way that they're supposed to be. But if you expected that, you would be wrong because his king, his son, Pekahiah, only reigns for two years and then he is murdered. He becomes king, he's an idolater, he's murdered, and then his murderer becomes king. You see a rather regular pattern here. And then the final one is King Pekah. And he's king for the longest of the five. He reigns for 20 years. But it's not a good 20 years. Because during the time of, of King Pekah, Assyria comes, having been bribed to go away a number of times in the past, will not be bribed again. And Assyria comes and captures almost all of Israel. All of Israel, except just a little part of the kingdom is left. To Israel, which will soon be extinguished. And because of his great failures here, Pekah as well is assassinated, and his murderer, Hosea, becomes king. Hosea, as we'll see soon, will be the last king of Israel. Now, what's the common refrain in all these kings? The common refrain in all these kings is he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. What's the root cause of all this destruction, of all the death and the turmoil and the chaos? The, the root cause of, of all of this is idolatry. The people of Israel, remember these are the same people, this is the same nation that the Lord split the Red Sea for them to walk through and now they've left the God who split the sea and they've begun to worship false idols made out of metal and set up for them by their wicked kings. And then on the other side you have Judah. King Uzziah reigns for 52 years then his son Jotham becomes king and a, a peaceful transfer of power. You have what a contrast. You have stability and security you have continuous and long reigns in the south, and you have instability and chaos and death in the north. Why, why the difference? Well, certainly there's a higher level of, of godliness in Judah than there is in Israel, but I don't really think that's the main reason for the difference. I don't think that's what the text tells us. I think the answer for the difference is found if you flip back to verse 12. You flip back to verse 12, and we read this. So the word of the Lord spoken to Jehu was fulfilled. Your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. The promise of God came to Jehu. Jehu was as close to, as close to a good king as Israel was going to get. Jehu was, was the king who was responsible for wiping out all of Ahab's family and for getting rid of the Baal worship in Israel. So the Lord comes to Jehu, and he makes a promise. The Lord promises that Jehu is going to have a, a four-generation dynasty, that he and his son and his son and his son are going to be king of Israel. And that's exactly what has happened. There's been four generations of Jehuites who have sat on the throne of Israel. But now the promise is up. And almost as soon as the Lord's promise is up and God has kept his word, Israel begins to self-destruct again. So what is, the, what is the difference? What is the difference between the two? You see, Judah had its own problems as well, didn't it? Idolatry, the prophet Amos blasts Judah in this time for its idolatry. Spiritually suspect kings. What's the difference between the two? The difference... It's simply this. The difference is grace. You see, God promised Jehu four generations. 
The four generations was up, and God's grace was gone. But what did God promise to David? God promised to David an eternal kingdom and an eternal dynasty. Why does Israel have one king after another after another being murdered and dynasty changing to dynasty changing to dynasty while Judah has one dynasty throughout it all because God made a promise to David and God was going to keep his promise. And even though his people, even though David's sons were oftentimes going to be wicked and foolish and proud, God made a promise and the promise was of grace and God was going to keep his promise of grace. You see, there are, two different, there are two different kinds of kingdoms in 2 Kings 15. There's a wicked kingdom that receives no grace, and there's a less wicked kingdom that receives grace. And there are two kinds of people in the world today. There are sinners who receive grace, and there are sinners who do not. We often think of grace as being what brings us into a relationship with God. And that's right. Grace is definitely, most definitely present in our conversion, whether it be in our old age and middle age and youth, or whether it be even like John the Baptist in the womb. There's always grace involved in coming to faith. We're right to think that way. We can recall the words from Ephesians 2 again. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. But grace is not necessary only to bring us into a relationship with the Lord. Grace is not necessary only to bring us into the blessedness of God. Grace is necessary for us to stay in a relationship with the Lord. What happens to us? What, what happens to us if God leaves us? We can strive and we can strive and we can strive, and it's right to strive, right? Paul talks about striving. Paul says in Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We can strive, though, but what if God says for just a moment, leave him. Let him to himself and see how he does. What happens if for just one moment God leaves you? you and I would most definitely leave him. You see, there's there's two kingdoms. There's two kingdoms here in Israel and Judah. There's one kingdom that God never leaves, and there's one kingdom that he does leave. And the difference, the difference is not between them. The difference between them is God. God sticks with the one with grace, and he leaves the other to wallow in its sin. So go back to these recent defections, these recent deconversions. What what do we make? What do we make of those who once professed Christ but now profess anything anything but? What do we do with them? Do we scorn them? No, what they've done is foolish, but you don't scorn them. Do we follow them? Well, certainly not. To follow them would be to leave Christ, and to leave Christ would be to leave life itself. What do we do? I think we take these simple words on our lips. But for the grace of God, there go I. There's no room for pride in looking at those who've left Christ. There's no room for pride because we look in ourselves with a healthy skepticism of our hearts and we say, that would be me unless God keeps me. We're dependent on God from beginning to end. I thought there was a very helpful article I read with an interview on a couple of different pastors, the first of which was John Piper, and it was kind of a roundtable interview type of thing. People were given an opportunity to ask him questions, and one particularly insightful questioner, I think, asked this. What would you say to those of us who have a healthy distrust of our own hearts, who look at this man who has now walked away from the gospel, and we say, could this happen to me too? Could I one day walk away from the gospel, walk away from my spouse, walk away from Christ? 
Could I do that? The answer is this that he gave. The short answer is yes. I could commit apostasy this afternoon and go to hell. If God is faithful to you, you will make it. If you don't make it, he didn't cause you to make it. That's humbling, isn't it? It's humbling to look at yourself with that healthy distrust of one's own heart and say, that could be me. But for God's grace, that would be me. What's the difference between the unbeliever and the believer? The difference is grace. God's grace. And God's grace is the chief reason, the principal reason for our worship. You see, when you get to, when you get to heaven one day, Lord willing, when you get to heaven one day and you, you stand before the Lord, he's, he's not going to come down off His throne and say, Whoo! I wasn't sure you were going to make it. I'm sure glad you're here. That's not how it works. When you stand before the Lord on that day, the words come from your lips. Thank you that I am here. Thank you that you have brought me all the way here. Now, we also want to hear those words, though we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But the well done, good and faithful servant has to do with what we do with God's grace, not with God's grace itself. We want to strive, we want to work, but we recognize that from beginning to end, salvation belongs to the Lord. But then what do we do with that? What do we do with, what do we do with that? We, we know that the difference is bound up in grace. So, so, so do we sit and cross our fingers, say, boy, I really hope the Lord keeps His grace for me going. No, but that's not what we're called to do. What God calls us to do is to make use of the things that He uses to keep us. What we do is we make use of the things that God has called us to make use of as He works His grace in us. What we do is we read. What we do is we sing. What we do is we listen. What we do is we rejoice and meet together. What we do is we pray we need to do what God has called us to do as he does the work of keeping us we need to do that we need to be reminded again and again and again we need to read again and again and again of God's glory we need to sing again and again and again of God's glory we need to worship together again and again and again as we celebrate God's glory together we need to hear the word of God preached again and again and again even perhaps at night. How hungry are you for God's Word? We need to pray again and again and again, God, keep me. Keep me. Save me. Protect me. Perhaps if we look at these kings, protect me most especially from myself. And then at the end of the day, we need to trust Him. We need to trust him. You know, I think the canons of Jordan are very helpful for thinking about this. In the fifth point, it goes on to address this. The canons say, those who have been converted could not remain standing in grace if left to their own resources. And it goes on farther. But God is faithful mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them and powerfully preserving them in it to the end. Paul says very much the same thing, Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What reason do we have for confidence? We belong to Christ, our King. And what kind of a king has no subjects? And what kind of a kingdom has no citizens? 
We belong to Christ who has been promised an eternal kingdom and an eternal people. And God promises to His Son that He will give Him a people. He has given them to Him in eternity and they will still be with them in eternity. That Christ is King. That Christ is the Son of David. And the Son of David will always sit on a throne and rule over a kingdom. Christ always sits on a throne and He will always have a kingdom to rule over. And the one who has begun a good work in us will most certainly carry it through to completion. Salvation is God's work from beginning to end. And in that middle, while God is still doing His work, that's where we trust Him. And how do we trust Him? We trust Him by doing the things He's told us to do. That article that I, that article that I focused on earlier, that I referred to earlier, had another. Another quote from a Baptist pastor, H.B. Charles. He said this, We need to be teaching and singing sound doctrine. I believe that there is no need for something exotic or special in order to build faith and sustain faith for the long haul. Wasn't that true in Israel? They didn't need new things. They didn't need new gods. They didn't need new golden calves. They didn't need new places to worship. They needed the same God. They needed the same sacrifices, the same prayers, the same word. They needed all the same things. They needed to be faithful, not innovative. What was going to keep them was sticking to the old things which God had given them, not finding new ways, not finding new ways to capture a new generation. We don't need new and exotic and innovative things in the church. We need the old things. We need the word. We need prayer. We need singing. We need worship. We need what God has given to us. We need to be faithful. Strength in Christ is found not in new things, but in God's Word. And so we need to be strengthened. We need to be strengthened in simple, ordinary, repeatable, God-ordained means of grace. We need to be in the Bible. We need to be on our knees. We need to lift up our voices together in song. We need to preach and pray and sing, and we need to eat. We need to eat. You know, we come to this table today, and we remember the words that Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. We're prone to forget, aren't we? So prone to forget. By the time Saturday comes, the joy and the satisfaction of Sunday can be long forgotten. And so we need to be reminded again and again and again of the goodness and the power and the grace of God. So he says, come and be reminded and remember. But he also says, this is my body. It's not just bread. It's his body. It's not his physical body. He, of course, as a man, is seated in heaven. But when we, when we eat, we are strengthened, not by a, a small piece of bread, but we are strengthened because we are united in the eating to the glorious body of Christ, who is so glorious and has been lavished with so many gifts by our Heavenly Father that He is able to strengthen each of us and carry us through each of our lives until we come to that very last day when we hear those glorious words, well done, and we fall upon our faces in joy and worship that God has brought us all the way home by His grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that 
together with the people of Israel and the kings of Israel, if left to ourselves, we would walk away and never look back. And so we plead with you, we pray that you would not let that be so for us. But God, keep us. When we wander, bring us back. Like the good shepherd, bring the sheep back into the fold. Don't allow us to become lost. We pray that you would protect us, most especially from ourselves and our own sinful desires and sinful hearts. Keep us grounded and rooted in your word. Keep us on our knees in prayer. Keep our voices fresh with your praise. Keep our hearts and souls filled with the righteousness of Christ offered even today as we feast at your table. We pray, God, that you would show your great grace to us, grace which is most certainly not deserved but given to us on account of Christ, that he might be the firstborn of many brothers. And so we rejoice that we have been brought into his kingdom, not as servants, not even merely as citizens, but as his brothers and sisters, as his co-heirs. Draw us, Father, into the very end and into your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.